Hello everyone and welcome to the Interlude YouTube channel. I'm Kira and today as part of our Authors Corner series I'll be having a conversation with Sean Felix about his new book of poetry, Did You Even Know I Was Here? For more Sean and more Authors Corner you can check out our website to read Sean's article with We Rob, see this interview, listen to his podcast episode, and most importantly find a link to purchase the collection. <laughs> So, Sean, I would love to start with the foreword of the book. Um, you share that the collection was written, edited, and arranged over three <laughs> sleepless nights um, to chronicle your love for Paris. And I'm so interested in the full story there. What was your relationship to Paris and or France and French before the city inspired these poems? And how did you write a whole collection in three days? Um, that's so. So yeah, I guess my like going all the way back, my love for Paris has been sort of with me, I guess, since high school. Um, you, now mind you, I wasn't the best French student. <laughs> in them. But um, taking French, I actually sort of, uh, I fell in love with the language, but then through the language, I sort of fell in love with the uh, French culture and um, sort of, and started reading French philosophy and French poetry. And um, and it just sort of grew, grew and blossomed over the course of years of becoming an adult and finding my way to French New Wave films. And then, uh, of course, Luc Besson, and, like watching things like Taxi and just, just loving, really loving French cinema and French literature um, to the point now where um, Baudelaire is one of my favorite poets. Um, and... You know, that that love was always from afar until um, December of 2019 when I got the opportunity to go to Paris. And, you know, I don't know if it was the excitement of finally arriving or if it was um, the espressos I couldn't help but having after dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I developed insomnia while I was there. Oh, wow. And so, you know, I was spending the days out and just sort of being inundated with the city and things that were going on there. Um, and then I was coming home or coming back to my hotel room and literally laying there. And I started just transcribing and transposing like everything that I was experiencing and how I was taking it in. And so, and that's where the collection came from. I was, wow. um, if you can imagine just literally laying in bed with a notebook or my notes app and it was just, I was just writing. I would just write all night long. And oh my goodness. No, I can't imagine that. You are <laughs> exceptionally blessed by this experience. Or, well, I'm sorry to hear you couldn't sleep, but wow. Yeah. And, and so, so yeah, it was just this, this thing, this torrent that just came rushing out of me. And, and then over the course of the, I, over the course of the like insomnia three days, you know, the sort of collection sort of pulled itself together there. And um, initially I saw it, I, I didn't see it as a collection so much as just experience. And then it sort of became collection um, as I sort of started looking at it more and more. Wow. And had you ever had insomnia before? Or was this the first time just poetic inspiration would not let you sleep? <laughs> I've, I've, I've only had ins true insomnia one other time. Um, Did you write that a was... collection of poetry that time? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, funny enough, I actually read Insomnia by Stephen King oh. when I had insomnia. <laughs> And, and then I actually, when I finished, I fell, I fell asleep. It was kind of. Wow. I bet you've had two <laughs> extremely literary experiences. And not being able to sleep. That's so interesting. Um, and yeah, when you say that the collection took shape, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about the way it's structured as well. Forgive me, I, I don't speak French, but we have sections like Arrival and Insomnia separated by an interlude of photos that you took on your trip. How did that come to shape? Yeah, I so the sort of when I put it when I pulled it all together, um, 
and just sort of laid it out. It the collection is broken up by sort of the the feel. It was sort of the feeling of being in the space. So the parts in Arrive are um, they're really sort of about the impressions um, of initially arriving. Um, it's why at the very beginning it's this it's this sense of arrival, but also a sense of um, almost like maybe I should say like sort of leaving other things behind mm -hmm. um, and sort of being able to see myself in a different way in this space. Um, and then, you know, that's that sense of always sort of becoming, always arriving. Um, that's what sort of informs that first earlier part. And then the insomnia part is having arrived now that we're here, um, sort of once the other foot hits the ground, then it's like, oh dear. Um, it's sort of the question of what am I becoming or what are we becoming um, once we've arrived in this space? And it's because, um, and the photo, the photo interlude just sort of works in that I've never sort of the way art plays it plays is played out in Paris is very different than the way art plays out here. Mm. Um, we sort of we put art in places here. Um, there was so much public art in Paris um, that seemed to just sort of be a, a life of the city. Mind you, the picture from a uh, the um, the crypt church um, is well clearly it's in a crypt church, but and Jesus in the crypt church. But um, the other photos really were just in the city, and they were just part of its life. And you can take the photos as sort of the arrival into the amazement, into the overwhelmed person losing sleep over the fact that there's so much going on um, that you, I don't know, you don't know um, as the viewer or taking it in, if you can really even handle it. Um, it's so powerful. Um, so yeah, the insomnia part is almost, it's almost the feeling of being overwhelmed. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's sort of its construction and its initial form, I will say, it's actually written as one long poem. Really? Yeah. Okay. So that's initially how I wrote it. And, um, that's why I said when I, initially when I said it was just this long outpouring, it was initially just one long thing. And it wasn't a stream of consciousness so much as, um, and I didn't realize that until a little bit later, but they were episodes. It was episodic in the way that it was happening, even though it was happening in sort of a linear fashion. Um, but yeah, it didn't become this collection until um, further, until deeper reflection. Interesting. So how did you choose where and how to break up what you had written? And so I'm hearing that you did write it chronologically, like the narrative <laughs> of this text is also the narrative of you writing it. Interest. So how did you decide where to put in those spaces? What was something that spoke independently as a poem? Yeah, I, normally when I, when I do things, it's, it's, when I write, it's all about the line and the structure and the cohesion of um, the moment. This one was, there were parts that were easier. So um, for instance, arrival sort of has its a poetic form um, versus one of a kind, which then is more like a prose poem. So you have a pretty distinct um, break there and at least in terms of how it's delivered. Um, but then some of the other ones are because I was trying to capture a particular place, um, where the images came from, that would sort of inform what that section was there. Um, 
and like the Pantheon and the Rue de Duquesne, um, those are particular places. And so they got their sort of, they got their sort of spot. Um, and, but then other ones were really, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it's not artificial. Some of them, it was really just the feeling, you know, you can, um, you find yourself in this space where because it was happening all at once, when you wanna explain it or deliver it to another person, you want them to be able to find their way in. Mm -hmm. And so breaking them up actually is really just providing them space. And so where you have um, the difference between two images, mm -hmm. if you have, um, you know, Revolutions of the Carousel ends with the sky and then waiting begins with sleep. And so it has sort of a natural, it had a natural break uh, in the narrative form. And in that way, the reader can actually find themselves, okay, yeah, looking at the sky and, but then thinking about sleeping and knowing that you can't, but you know, you know, the mood has changed. And so, um, and so the thoughts have changed and it, it actually was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when it happened. But uh, so, yeah, that was really place made it easy. Um, imagery also made it a little bit easy to find those breaks in the, um, the narrative experience. Yeah, fascinating. So I was going to ask also about your relationship with form. And that feels tied to this idea of like, I've written one big, long thing. How do we break it up into individual forms? Um, when I first encountered your work, it was on Instagram where you post haiku. <laughs> and in my head, I'm like, this is a poet who's really interested in form and concision um, in like syllable counting. And it was so interesting to see you playing around with all these different kinds of forms in the collection. What would you say your relationship is to form as a poet and how did that help the collection take shape? Uh, so form is, I'm not a, I will, I will, I will be very honest with the audience. I'm not a, um, the only form I've ever truly written for a very long time and is in haiku. Um, that's the, that's a form that I've sort of stuck with and have really consistently written in for a while. Uh, in my education as a poet, my formal education as a poet, um, we had to practice writing in forms and I, there's some forms that I absolutely love. Um, like villanelles, um, I wish I, I wish I really loved sonnets, but I can't. I can't quite get there with them. <laughs> That's um, very fair. This is a safe space for not loving sonnets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but the act, the act and art of poetry has always been um, an act of expression while having. Uh, while focusing on the economy of language. Um, and in that way, um, there are two things that can happen. You can focus on the line and delivering the image um, as powerful, as, with as much power and impact as you can. Um, but when you do that in terms of your imagery, you can sometimes lose your reader. Um, mm -hmm. If you're just trying to get the images, get the images in there and sort of fascinate uh, when you're when you're creating, I st I personally still love the that economic value of getting the image in there to the reader, but also making sure that it sings, if yeah. that makes. Um, since okay. so even though it's free verse um, when I write lines I want the lines to actually sing and be musical and so in in that way the um, even though it's free verse the form that I focus on is actually in the way that not necessarily in the way that won't, someone would speak but in the way that someone experiences music mm -hmm. Um, and so, 
So as I write the lines, you can have, you know, I'm, I always try to make sure that uh, if I use a single word on the line that it really has, there's a reason for that to be. And so I don't think I do that too much in, the, in here. Um, there's some, there are actually some much longer lines in here. And because of their length, they actually create this sort of sing-song structure mm -hmm. as you move through it. And I wonder, and I've actually, thank you for this question, because I never really thought about <laughs> it. Um, yeah. But I, want, I wonder if it was um, how much Parisian, how much of the music of the space Interesting, informed yeah. the way that the lines came out. Um, because I would imagine that um, there is there's something there to it. Uh, I'll have to listen to La Vie en Rose later <laughs> and read the poetry and yeah, see how it's the put connection. It. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, I wanted to ask a little bit more about your experience in Paris and how it specifically informed the poems. I know there are particular landmarks like we talked about, and particularly statues. That's one of my favorite poems um, that they speak to directly. The reader gets a taste of this physicality also in the photographs that you feature that we talked about a little bit as well. You were like, not only are you going to feel this physical space with me in the poem, I'm going to show it to you with these beautiful <laughs> black and white images. Um, <laughs> how would you say that your poetry was influenced or inspired by these spaces? Or maybe even yeah, more about the music. It's really interesting. Yeah, I would say that one of the things about, uh, one of the things that struck me almost immediately. So um, if you, if you remember in December, 2019, the, um, one of the, it, before the yellow vest strike in, um, Paris, there was a, there was a, um, public worker strike going on. So we couldn't, um, the Metro was, I think the Metro, you could only go certain stops, mm -hmm. but for the most part, it was on foot almost the entire time or in, oh, wow. um, in an Uber or something like that. And so, and luckily some of the museums were open and things like that, but a lot of other things were um, closed. Paris was one of the first places I'd been where I talked about the art and how public the artworks were, but the buildings, I had never been to a place minus, um, I went to Krakow, Poland at one point and like, and there are actual castles like, on castles like Whoa. in the middle of the city um yeah. it was the first place i saw where remnants of the monarchy and reminders of revolution and the republic existed in the same space mm -hmm. and so you know you go to the louvre and you're walking through a palace that's an art museum with art that's rem that are remnants of colonialism inside of the palace, but it's a public, I mean, you have to pay to go, but it's a public building. And, you know, you go to the Pantheon and the Pantheon is literally filled with images and statues and reminders of revolution yeah. and the creation of the Republic. And, you know, the idea that these things are like sitting right next to one another um, and the people, myself included, because I was there, like are, is existing in this space, um, watching it, watching a city grapple with its own history in, in like real time is, was incredible. Yeah. Um, and so... The fact that I'd never, I'd, I'd just never experienced it before. Being here, it's, you know, I can go downtown, I can see the monuments and things like that, but it's, for lack of a better word, this country's young. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and that country is, is old. They've, they've gone through um, their kings and they've gone through their, um, the reign of terror, um, you know, and, you know, and at the same time, you've got this river running right through the middle of um, the city. And 
um, there are parts of the river where you can stand and there are parts of the river that are flooded. And, and so the architecture and the statuary and everything is just, it's sort of a constant living and breathing that's happening there of it. Yeah. Um, you almost, you almost can't get away when you're, when you're, and when you're there like in Paris in that way. And so it comes out, you know, that's, that's part of that overwhelming feeling, like trying to parse that while you're, while it's, ha like while you're also trying to go see the water lilies. And <laughs> yeah, and have to like live through that extremely layered, like fossilized experience. Yeah, and, and you know, and then you look at the people and it's happening on the street. You know, there were, um, you know, you mentioned architecture, but like it's sort of that idea of like colonialism and things like that. It is reflected in the people that are there as well. You know, people selling, the people selling tchotchkes at the foot of the Eiffel Tower um, are guys from Senegal. Um, yeah, oh, I selling, love that line. Yeah. Yeah. And they're selling these things that are here and, and you're, and you're watching, and they're selling it to tourists who are there to experience this thing, but, you know, and they're there because of the history of France in Africa, and it's just, it's just incredible to, to want to see it happen and to experience it in that way. Um, you know, you wanted, I wanted to grasp some of it in the, in the writing. Um, yeah. So... Feels very. I think I caught that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And one of my questions is going to be like, Sean Felix Lover in the audience. They've got their collection in their suitcase. They're in Paris. Where should they go to kind of get at some of the emotion of your experience? And I feel like we ticked off several landmarks there. Of like, yeah. I never thought about that. I've been in the Louvre and I hadn't thought about that history of like, this is a castle. This is now a public art museum. This is art that in many ways has, has been stolen through colonialism. Like the way that all of those experiences are tied together. I can see how it would keep a poet up at night <laughs> in a very <laughs> literal sense. <laughs> um, I also, so I, yeah, I love the line you mentioned about um, the men by the Eiffel Tower. I also love, there's a line towards the end of the collection in the numbered section. Um, traveling to Paris was as much a search for an artistic home as it was to find a place where I could not be me for a change. But I am too old to not be me where I go, and so I watched. Um, I, I just love that. And how do you see yourself as an observer, watcher, speaker manifest in this collection? I'm interested in this feeling of needing to be separate from oneself to find an artistic home, that you're leaving some part of you here in the States. Yeah. I, um... You know, being an being, I've I've been an observer for like most of my life, um, and sort of watching the, watching the world go, and trying to understand it and under, understand myself and my relation to it. Um, but the idea of traveling and Paris is special because it's it's the place where. Um, so my literary idol is James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. It's the place where he went. Yeah. Um, when sort of this country was too much. Um, and the opportunity to, the opportunity to leave some of that stuff behind. Mm -hmm. um, and mind you, I knew I, I knew I was coming back. Yeah. <laughs> no. But being able to let it, let that stuff go. And it, you know, I could sort of expound on what stuff is, but leaving part of myself behind so that I could go somewhere else and almost be just new. I could be new for a week. It felt like, it felt like an opportunity. It felt like something special. Um, but you know, even though you leave something behind, the eyes that you travel with, they sort of carry all of that memory. Yeah. And so as an observer, you're you're taking it into this 
I don't know, person you've always you've always wanted the opportunity to be. And you sort of pull you pull it all together and you you do actually become someone new. I'm not the same person here that I was before I went. And you know, and that's and that's good and that's good and bad. Um, when you go to a place and you're not, um, and you leave a part of yourself behind, you know, there's the op there's the option of actually losing yourself in a place. Yeah. Um, but here and in this experience and in this moment, it was, and it's and it's possibly because I am, um, I have anchors here, like I have children and like a house and like things like that. And so um, there was always a reminder of who I was um, that was sort of with me. But, but you're right, this, this observation of leaving things behind to see the world and see the reflection of the, uh, and get a reflection of the world in you is, was something very powerful mm -hmm. um, for me in, in the travel and in that moment. And to be perfectly honest, it's something I actually want to experience again. Actually. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And it's why, I think it's why, I think it's why any of us really travel um, to be able to actually have that experience. Um, and, you know, surprise, you can surprise yourself with what you do see um, in the place and what you see of yourself in the place um, when you have that, when you're, when you're doing it, so. It's, a, it's truly a beautiful thing. And uh, I don't know, we can talk about, we, we'll probably get into love a little bit later, but like it, it, it's, almost a, it's almost a love experience. Yeah, absolutely. And it's cool to have it crystallized so firmly in something so physical. <laughs> you yeah. can pick up this collection and be like, this is that week of my life. It's really interesting. Yeah. And so, and I've, I've, I didn't know, I didn't think I would read this as many times as I have. <laughs> really? I've, I've actually read, I've read it, I've read this so many times. And I really enjoy it. I really enjoy returning That's to the goal, you. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a um, good sign. Yeah, I, and, you know, full disclosure, I, things I've written, um, I actually don't, I haven't, really returned to for a very long time and this one i i it's actually on my bedside i i actually read it all the time um so that i can have so i can have that experience again yeah um, hey, you got me well, thinking yeah, you got me let's really talk about love you're in the headspace i want to hear about it <laughs> like the the love that you kind of crystallize in this collection for the city but also the love that the speaker experiences throughout the poems how does that how did that take shape for you? Yeah, that's, God, love is. <laughs> You're walking in a true, like, poetic history. I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Traveling to Paris, falling in love with the city, being a poet. <laughs> I know, it, it's, like, and I, I, you know, I'm going to own it. Like, even, like, with everything, I'm, I'm just, I, I have to own that. Like, it is. It's something that is, it's so important that I don't know if we're necessarily, uh, we're sort of trained not to be really earnest in how we experience or how we portray and talk about love yeah. in that way. And, you know, and I want to say inside the book, love isn't, like, love is not easy in this collection. Like love is very, very complicated um, to the point of, you know, it almost, you could say it almost ends in heartbreak, uh, that type of love. But the experience of it is, it's invaluable. You can't, you can't shy away from it. And when you're in, when I was in Paris, like, you know, I was there, you the love was just sort of like 
pouring out of me and it was something that I wanted um it was reciprocated but it was reciprocated in like so many different ways um, and it's not just the love for the city it's also that exposure of love for the self and the love for like the other mm -hmm. i you know i'm trying to think of all of the I, in my head right now, I'm trying to see all the people that I met and all, all the people I talked to when I was there. And, you know, I wouldn't go out and say, I love, I fell in love with every single person I ran into. Um, but those faces and those people um, are part of a shared experience of mine now. Yeah. Like they're part of, they're part of my heart now. And so when I think about who I am and I reflect on um, who I became because I had this experience, the love that I have for myself is extended to all of those people um, because I am like, it's all one big thing. And the same thing goes to, the same thing is extended to the life that I live right now. Mm -hmm. um, trying to, trying to show and trying to experience love for everyone that I encounter, at least a little bit, um, is something that I really wish and hope to extend um, in everything that I do. Every way, any way that I can express myself, I'm actually showing my love for the people I'm expressing myself to. And when someone expresses themselves to me, I hope that um, I can show them that I appreciate what they're what they're giving me yeah um and you know paris is it's a city of lights and it's a city of love and you know i don't know if there are other cities that can make that happen yeah. um but for me this is what paris did for me um, it gave me that ability to really articulate and be okay with saying that that I love and that it is okay to love. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's really wonderful. Well, thank you. And thank you for sharing it with us. And your yeah. and um, oh, crap. Okay, that unfortunately takes us to time. I have to ask you my final question. Oh, um, my God. <laughs> so for our Authors Corner project, we are promoting authors who have published to small indie presses, and you have taken it as indie as they come by self-publishing your book. <laughs> uh, can you talk to us just a little bit about your path to publication and how the book came to be? Yeah. So I, um, so I had this collection, and... I actually brought it home, I wrote it, and I showed it to a very good friend of mine. Um, and I was like, hey, you know, you want to read some poems I wrote when I was in Paris? Like, and she's like, absolutely. And so she read it and she was like, well, you realize you have to publish this now. <laughs> and, um, oh, okay, Sh sure. Like, and so, um, so I went through the process of putting it together um, and packaging it. But I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, again, I'm, I'm being honest tonight. Uh, I'm very impatient. Yeah. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so, and so what I wanted to do was I wanted to get it out to people as like in the easy, in the fastest way that I could. Um, and so I looked around and I was like, well, I have a very, I have another good friend who's a comic um, writer and he lives in the Netherlands and he self-published his own comic book and did a Kickstarter and, um, and it worked out for him. And so I talked to him and he was like, yeah, man, just publish your, just publish your own thing. Like find a way to get it out to the people and, you know, people will respond. And so I took his advice and uh, I went to Politics and Prose. They have a, um, I think it's called Opus Publishing. Uh, and I was like, okay, well, I needed, because I had the book, but I needed to somehow to print it. 
And, and so it was really helpful to like have a printing press. The first time I did it, I actually used a local printing press in Tacoma Park. Oh, wow, and, yeah. And to get it out to people. And most of the people who I like gave it to were like friends, colleagues, family. Um, and then once they had read it and they were like, I was like, man, these, this thing kind of has legs. I think, I think it should just keep, I should just keep going with it. And so I found another um, printer and now it's, now it just sort of has, now it just sort of lives and it has a life of its own. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but it also means that there's a lot of work that goes into it. I have to, you know, and this is the thing that my buddy was telling me about, you know, he goes to comic book shops. He's in the, U he's in the EU right now. Mm -hmm. And so he's on foot, he's hustling, he's in comic book shops. He's trying to um, get people to pick it up. And it's the same thing for me. You know, I want to get it out as to as many people as possible, uh, but it's a lot of hustle. Yeah. yeah. And now I feel comfortable enough to start sending it out to like manuscript, um, you know, contests and things like that. But really at the end of the day, I think this is something that the book and I are sort of had to do this together. Um, yeah. And, and I actually, and like speaking about it now, I kind of probably wouldn't want it any other way. Uh, so, you know, marketing is a, it's a quite a thing. The hustle is quite a thing. Yeah. Um, getting it on the shelves is quite a thing, but it is, it really brings you, sort of closer to the work I think yeah. when you're when you have that relationship yeah absolutely wow well we are here to help with that hustle <laughs> um, and I hope everybody watching this right now picks up a copy if they don't already have one um with that in mind could you tell all of our viewers where they can find you either on the internet or where they could find the book in real life so yeah so um on the internet and um I promise I will be much more, I'll post a lot more things, but um, <laughs> my handle uh, on Instagram is at the Dawn Rider. So T-H-E-D-A-W-N-W-R-I-T-E-R, -E -E all smashed together. Um, and uh, same thing on Facebook. And then as far as where you can purchase the book, uh, it's at Potter's House uh, right now in the author's mm -hmm. corner. Which in the is author's lovely. corner? Check yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you could also find it in um, politics and prose bookshops. Okay, and, excellent. Yeah. yeah, and you can find us, The Inner Loop, at The Inner Loop Lit on Twitter and Instagram, as well as just The Inner Loop on Facebook. And if you have not checked out the Potter's House in DC for our in-person author's corner with lovely copies of this and some blurbs about the book, feel uh, please check it out if you haven't yet. Okay, lovely. thank you so much, Sean, for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been wonderful. It's every time I have these interviews, there's always this moment of self-discovery. Yeah, um, I feel like we, I, we got through a lot, <laughs> a lot of wheels turning in the middle of it. Um, but okay, check us out. Find Sean on the internet and in person. And thank you guys so much for watching. Bye.